Good morning. I greet you in the wonderful and powerful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, whose spirit is with us as we worship together this day. Uh, for those who are listening on radio or following uh, by way of live streaming, we welcome you as well and pray that you'll feel connected and blessed by this time we offer to God this hour. There's a phrase you're going to be hearing uh, more of in the coming weeks. The phrase is all in. Uh, to me, that means commitment, whether it's sports, whether it's business. If you say, I'm all in, then I'm dedicated. When we say all of us are in, that means as a congregation, as a family, we are in together. I'm not going to say any more about that right now, but do look to the newsletter uh, and other social media uh, opportunities to learn more about that in the coming weeks. Notice also there are some new groups forming and new opportunities for study. There's a young adult group forming, uh, and they have already met and are planning uh, activities in fellowship, ministry, and study. And so I encourage you there to follow those opportunities. Some of our congregation, they are away this weekend. What a beautiful weekend to be out in God's world doing what they do. They're scamping. Uh, and uh, whatever that means, I know it's a blessing. We wish them well. I want to share a word about one of our Children's Center families this past week. Uh, that fam a family lost a parent to complications due to COVID. Uh, the family has two young girls, age five and three, and the youngest attends our children's center at Mulberry. Of course, there is sadness, there is grief, but there's also hardship for this family. Our love and concern, of course, go out to them. They are part of who we are at Mulberry. But we can also help in this time of need. On Communion Sunday, we always have an offering. You'll see the offering plates uh, on the outside aisles. Uh, those funds go to the pastor's discretionary fund. The pastors uh, and Julia and I have met, and today we're dedicating uh, that communion offering to this family to help them in this time of need. It will be dedicated today directly to them. Thank you in advance for your generosity. The first Sunday in October is World Communion Sunday. United Methodist congregations join others around the world, as well as other Christian communities, uh, to celebrate our connectedness. It began at Shadyside Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1933. Congregation sought to uh, demonstrate the interconnectedness of Christian churches regardless of denomination and they appropriately chose the sacrament of Holy Communion to symbolize that union. Every time we gather over the sacraments we have the chance to remember that interconnectedness but more importantly we are reminded of God's love for all people. And so I encourage you to take time this week to remember Christ as he calls us to do, to remember God's love, and to be encouraged by the Holy Spirit to love others, all others, as God loves us. Let us worship our Lord. The Lord be with you. And also. Please join me in our call to worship as we read responsibly. Almighty God, from the ends of the earth, you have gathered us around Christ's holy table. We come to feast together. O living Christ, you invited us from north and south, east and west. We come to feast together. O Holy Spirit, have mercy on your church 
too often divided, renew us and make us one. Amen. Please remain standing as we express our affirmation of faith and recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker in heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born under the Virgin Mary, suffered upon Pontius Pilate, was crucified and dead the third day he arose from the dead he ascended into heaven and she is the right hand of God almighty where he come to judge the quick and the dead I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting Amen seated. Our Old Testament reading is found in the book of Psalms, Psalm 8, God the Great Creator. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. 
When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beast of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the sea, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
from month to month, a different pastor stands in this pulpit, but the same choir is blessing us month after month, week after week. Thanks be to God for uh, their faithfulness and their steadfastness. Please listen to the Word of God from the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and then skipping over to chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels. But someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It is fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I suppose from time to time I have preached on an entire chapter of the Bible. Mostly when you step in the pulpit, you, uh, you preach on a, a passage, maybe a, a paragraph or so, sometimes uh, just on a single verse. Uh, really what I want to do today is is dwell on about half a verse. How about that? Really, when you get right down to it, even less than half a verse, about five words. But here's the half a verse from Hebrews. By the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Man, I love that. Speaking about Jesus, by the grace of God, that's Hebrews part of chapter 2, verse 9, that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. This verse is, I call it a treasure that is, as it were, is kind of lost in that New Testament attic called Hebrews. I mean, how long has it been since you've read Hebrews? And if you have read it, you've probably gotten bogged down rather quickly. But this verse, these words are a treasure. By the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. The New Testament writers, every one of them, were smitten by the love of God. 
and they employed so many rich metaphors to describe God's universal offer of salvation. Sadly, we have reduced this rich variety of language to a few stock phrases. So we go around saying, Christ died for me. Christ took my place on the cross. Jesus paid the price. It's not that there are anything wrong with those verses, although some of them really don't quite come out of Scripture. It's just that the, the New Testament is far richer than just those stock formulas. Flannery O'Connor uh, said about us in the South that we are Christ-haunted, and a part of that uh, uh, milieu means that most of us are involved in the Billy Graham mode of evangelism. You've got to come down and, and make a personal decision. Faith becomes exclusively about God and me. Now, I've got no problem with that part of the faith. I'm glad that God and, and I, uh, I, I hope, know each other. I'm glad that, that this Hoosier with a school teacher father and a secretary mother who grew up across from the cornfields of central Indiana, I'm glad that there is this sense of relationship. But we have to be careful that we don't just reduce faith down to where it's just kind of me and God me and my best buddy, God, upstairs. Charles Wesley, whose hymn we sang as we came in and whom we heard the choir so beautifully sing this morning, Charles Wesley knew about uh, the, the personal sense of, uh, of a relationship with God, but one of Charles Wesley's favorite words is the word all. In the hymn we sang this morning, I just counted it up. He uses the word all seven times. And just in that one hymn, that, that Jesus died for all. As uh, Hebrews puts it, he tasted death for everyone. And I want to suggest that if we're not careful and we just make this between, be between you and me and God, that we can, we, we can be in danger of getting a little bit too narrow and exclusive. Some of you have read and love C.S. Lewis's 1942 book, The Screwtape Letters. The Screwtape Letters are... Um, a series of letters written from a senior devil, Screwtape, to his junior understudy, Wormwood. And Screwtape is always trying to help Wormwood understand how we get people to hell. And uh, in one of the letters, um, Wormwood has to confess, well, my, my victim is starting to go to church now. What do I do? He's, he's going to church. I, we seem to be going in the wrong direction. And Screwtape says, don't, don't worry about him being in church. Have him take a look at his neighbor, uh, the person who's sitting next to him, and, and he'll see that that person has oily hair, and he won't like that person. And then have him look in the other direction, and he'll see somebody that's wearing a, a wardrobe that's way out of date, and, and, he, and he won't like that person. And, and then have him look back behind him. There's his the person he buys his groceries from who is oftentimes grouchy. And pretty soon our victim will beginning to think that he is superior to everybody else. And we've got him right where we want him. Keep him thinking, Wormwood, that he's better than other people. He tasted death for everyone. When I get right down to it, I really don't even want to preach on two words this morning. I'd just like to preach on one word, everyone. Everyone. He tasted death for everyone. What's the largest crowd you've ever been in? Anybody been to... Times Square on New Year's Eve, he tasted death 
for everyone there. Any of you go to Sanford Stadium yesterday? He tasted death for everyone there, even those Arkansas players. <laughs> maybe this is not the largest crowd you've ever been in, but maybe the most uh, tightly packed in that train that runs below Hartsfield, and you feel like you're in a can of sardines. He tasted death for everyone. Do you know how many people have lived and died in the history of this world? I do. I do because I asked my good friend Siri <laughs> yesterday. There have been since Adam and Eve, although this is not exactly the way Siri put it, she didn't start us with that, there have been 117 billion people that have lived since we got started. 117 of us, 117 billion of us. He tasted death for everyone. Now in my younger days of preaching, I would have tried to explain that to you. I would have elaborated on the finer points of theology. I understand the finer points of theology. I'm reading Augustine's City of God right now. He spends 36 chapters talking on angels. That's more than I need to know. In my younger days, I would have tried to explain to you uh, what all this means. We, we said, let me unpack this for you. But as I grow older, I'm hoping my preaching is getting simpler. I don't mean simplistic, but I hope it's getting simpler. Taste of death for everyone. No detours in this sermon. No digressions in this sermon. Taste of death for everyone. If you want me to speculate over those who lived and died before Jesus, I'm not going to do that. You want to talk about the unbaptized? Go find somebody else to talk that with. Do you want to talk about those who are unrepentant? Find somebody else. It's not going to be in this sermon. Do you want to talk about whether heaven has only 144,000 or maybe there are a few more there? Do you want to talk about what the population of hell is? Do you want to know whether you have to recite the sinner's prayer before you get in or whether Adolf Hitler is there? Talk to somebody else. He tasted death for everyone by the grace of God. Everyone means everyone. Or to translate that into Southern, all means all, y'all. My time is drawn to a close in the pulpit this morning. I want to circle back to the C.S. Lewis theme for just a minute. If we could accept and embrace that he tasted death for everyone, I think it could radically change the way we love and accept others. If I start looking at everybody and realizing he tasted death for them, too. It just kind of shifts things. Earlier this week, I was driving home um, on Riverside Drive. I was heading south toward town. Coming up the sidewalk there on that busy road was a rather large person she was wearing a sleeveless top, flowered print. 
she caught my eye because she was slowly pushing an equally large wheelchair uphill. She was limping as she pushed. There was nothing in the wheelchair except an oversized bag. I assumed she was homeless. I don't know. I watched her because the traffic was really slow that day. I had time to watch her. She made it to the bus stop. I wondered where she was going. I realized it was a bus stop. She turned the chair, removed the bag, and sat in her wheelchair to await the next bus. That's it. I drove on. Maybe, maybe if I hadn't been working on this sermon that week, maybe I would not have given her a second thought. I don't know what you think about people that you think are homeless. I have varying thoughts about them. But I was driving under the influence that day. I was driving under the influence of Hebrews 2.9. He tasted death for everyone. Not just the driver of that, is, of, uh, of that Prius, but for the one who was pushing that wheelchair. He died for you and for me and every single other one of the 116,999,999,998 of us created in God's image, all who ever lived. Amen. Hear this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another everywhere around the world. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love, and we have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. May the peace of Christ be with you.
The Lord be with you. And also, also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is right. Uh, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. I invite you to stand for the great thanksgiving. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You have made from one every nation and people to live on the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Jesus commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations and today his family and all the world, we all join at his holy table. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Let us together as God's little children pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. He tasted death for everyone. He spilled his blood for everyone.
Let us pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. There are so many, many, many ways to commit or recommit yourself to Christ and the church. One of them, but by far not the only one, is to join the church. To say, I want to be a part of uh, Jesus' company um, here at Mulberry Street. And if you're feeling that kind of urge of the Spirit just to become a, a little bit more deeply committed, then uh, I invite you to come uh, meet Tommy and me on the front steps here as we prepare to stand now and sing our final hymn. Would you stand? children of God, every one of you made in the image of God. Go out into God's world. Be God's people. Go in the name and in the power and in the spirit and in the confidence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.